enter into chapter 9. So can we agree? Can we agree that there needs to be a revival today? In the land that we're living in, from the people of God, there needs to be a revival. I'm not talking about Reedy Branch Baptist Church. I'm talking about the church of God, all of us. That there really needs to be a, a revival. I believe the church needs to be revived. I'm, it seems that that before we can before we can see others come to know God, Jesus as their Savior, they've got to see Him in us. And it it we we need we need some motivation. We need some we need something to take place in our lives. And I, I believe that something is we need to see take place as a revival. I think the world needs to see that. Needs to see that the people of God are on fire for God. That we're not worried about the election results. They need to see that we're not, we're not concerned about our own health when it comes to this virus. That we're not concerned about how this world may come and attack us because we know who holds us as well as who holds tomorrow. They need to see that we are a people who are excited each and every day. Uh, just, think, just thinking about things, I, I made this statement in, in Divinity School, and I was just copying something I heard one of our other preachers say. Um, it was talking about the difference in today versus 50 years ago. At uh, that time, maybe 40 years ago, how the church is so different. How before there was a loyalty to, to your church. There was a loyalty to your denomination. There was a, a, when mom and daddy grew up in a church, the children wanted to be in that church. And today, that's not the case. We're living in a time where we've got to consider some things. We've got to consider how our children are being taught and also consider the, the areas in where they're taught. We've got to consider things outside of just the Word of God, which is the most important thing that we, we have on Sunday morning when we come to gather is God's Word. But there are other things we're having to consider that 40, 50 years ago it wasn't a big concern. And I made the statement, yeah, it seems like the way the world is turning against the church and the way even church folks can't be satisfied with, with church is God just got us in a mess. Things are just different. It, it's harder to keep the church going forward today than it was years ago. Oh, when I said that, I struck a nerve with some, some folks. Now, some of them were much younger. They were more starry-eyed and they had... They had in their mind they were going to conquer the world. Uh, but the further I've, I've gone in this, the more I understand that they were right and I was wrong. That God hasn't got us in the mess. We've got ourselves in the mess. Here we are trying to minister in a time very different than before. A time when, when there is no respect for the house of God by the world. Uh, where you have to put alarm systems and you have to uh, have people watching out when they're coming in, where you're having to have people watching the backs of those counting the money. When we, We've got cameras looking out to see what's going on in the parking lot. We, we've got security teams in our churches, not security equipment, but security teams. So we've got men and women in our churches concealed carry, it's a different time than 40 years ago. But it's still the time God has prepared us for. If we're here in this time, God's prepared us for this time. We could have been born 40 years earlier than what we were born. And if we had been, some of us wouldn't be here today. I, I'm sure I wouldn't be here. I don't, I don't expect to live to be 90. So I... I'm convinced that God allowed me to be born in the time that he did because he was going to prepare me for the time that we're in. I'd hate to know my grandmother at 93, 93, 94 when she passed. I'd hate to know that she knew 
that we had, we or other churches in the community had people armed in the church to protect the church. She'd lose her mind. <laughs> uh, it, it just would have been something she couldn't have fathomed. But, but it's a different time. So we minister in the time that we are in. Well, here in this time, and it was a day of, it was a day much like today. It was a day where there was immorality and wickedness, lawlessness, violence. It was a time of dishonesty and deceit. Uh, people were feeling empty and purposeless. They were lonely and discouraged. Many were depressed. And because we even see that today, we see that there needs to be a revival in the land so that the people can see that there's hope and the hope comes through the church. It comes through Jesus Christ. Now, before we get too hard on this world that we're in, we have to understand a lot of the problems that we face in the world, we face in the church. Because within the church, we'll have those who are caught up with possessions and pleasures of the world. They're caught up in the immoral and wicked behavior of the world. And we can honestly say that the church today really it needs revival. Not just so the world can see it, but so that we can refocus our hearts and minds to where it needs to be. And not on ourselves. Well, we find this has took place. Now, think about this. Ezra and the Jews that come with him had grown up basically in Babylon. They finally get to come home to a place that they had been told about. And now that they've come home, after just a little while, they've become complacent. They've become uh, un, uh, unmotivated, so to speak. And here Ezra is confronted with a crisis that threatened the very life of this small community of exiles that had returned with him. The crisis involved a terrible sin seeped into the lives of these returned exiles. And many of them were engaging in just evil behavior along with unbelieving neighbors. So here we look in verses 1 and 2 in chapter 9. And we begin to kick off exactly some of the things that's taking place. He said, when these things were done. Now, what was done? The temple had been. Had, uh, they'd come to prepare the temple. They, they had offered up the offerings. They had placed everything where it needed to be. When these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that so that the holy seed is mixed with peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. The hand of the leaders and rulers were basically leading this trespass. So here we find after being there about five months, five months is all it took. They left a pagan country that they grew up in. They've come home a place where God said, I'll give this to my people. It had been in ruins and God had sent exiles back years before to start repairing some things. They had got complacent. He sent these exiles here now to finish the temple so that they can dedicate it and they can start worshiping. And here after five months, they're becoming complacent again. If we look in Ezra 7 and 9, it says on the first day of the first month, he began to journey to Babylon. And then if we look in Ezra 10 and 9, 
He says, so the men of Judah and, Be and Benjamin gathered with Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th day, uh, day of the month. So here in five months of getting back, five months of getting settled back into their, their home, they, they begin to find themselves in wicked behavior. So just five months, Ezra began to sense this need for revival. Many of the people were not living their lives. They were not living their lives in, in spiritual separation by the command of God. So here, obviously, he had begun teaching ministry. He had begun a teaching ministry among the people after they had arrived. He would begin instructing them in the word of the Lord and apparently a spirit of conviction struck the hearts of some, and particularly the leaders. They, be, they came to Ezra confessing their sin. They were engaging in detestable and immoral and wicked behavior with unbelievers. Uh, this, following this evil lifestyle and false worship of their neighbors, that's what they were doing. They were following others. You know, it's, there are things in this world that that we can get in places and we can find safe places. And once we get outside of that safe place and we start looking around, we can take our eyes off of what was taught in that safe place. Uh, you know, <laughs> camp, camp, church camp, um, Ridgecrest, a wonderful place. It's a wonderful place that we send our kids whenever we have the opportunity. And when we send them, they learn about the, the Word. They learn about the Bible. They hear the Bible the whole time they're there, from the time they get off the bus to the time they get back on it to depart. It's about prayer. It's about Bible study. Even the games they play, when they finish up playing the games, they gather them together and they give spiritual um, insight fr from those games. They use those games as illustrations and they bring biblical principles into those illustrations. They may even pull out a, a storyline within the scripture to show what the game represented. It, it's the whole time they're there. They're, they're challenged to, to have devotional time. They're challenged to have Bible study time. They're just challenged by the word of God and they're refreshed when they leave there, and then they get school. Within a couple months, they go to school, and they're thrown out almost to the wolves, so to speak. And oftentimes, they can find themselves falling back in their, their old behavior. Even when they had recommitted their lives, they're at camp. We see that happening at church. We see it happening in vacation Bible school. We see that happening even with adults. You know, when adults go to, go to a treatment center, it's safe. It's safe. And oftentimes, they don't want those same adults to go back home. They would rather them stay in a place that they're not familiar with and become familiar with that area because when they go back home, it's not as safe because they know where all the wickedness lies. They know where all the temptations are at. So here, <laughs> with these folks, they had never lived here before. They had never lived in, in Israel. The ones, I mean, they had spent 70 years, the children of Israel spent 70 years in, in Persia. And now they're back. Most of the ones that are back, they were born there. And here, <laughs> here the... They find themselves outside of this, of a protected area. They find themselves just gazing upon what they see and wanting to take part in everything. Well, Oh, they don't have that back home. Let me go see what it's all about. Yeah, we get into a lot of stuff when we hit big cities. 
things that we don't normally see um, in small towns. Yeah, we, we can get into a lot of, of trouble that way. We go to it, we start exploring. Curiosity, it begins to get the better of us. And it begins to lead us down a, a dead end road. Uh, note, note that the neighbors that they're, they're listing here. These neighbors, um, they, they were known throughout scripture as being heathens. They, they all worship many gods. They, didn't, they weren't monotheistic, or if they were, it wasn't the God of Israel. They, they, were, uh, they, were, they were doing all sorts of pagan things. But in here, what started out was that they started marrying into this group. And when they started marrying into this group, then they started behaving like this group. They took on their culture. Uh, it was, and by them marrying into these unbelievers, it was a direct violation of God's holy commandments. In, in, chap, in chapter 36, oh, chapter 34 of Exodus, verse 14 through 16, it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods. And one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice, and you take of his daughters for your sons. And his daughters play the harlot for their gods, and they make your sons play the harlot for their gods. Basically, it's saying here that if you... If you find yourself connecting with unbelievers, it's more likely they're going to win you than you're going to win them. You know, the oddest thing that I would hear when I was coming up, uh, I, you know, I, I was in places I shouldn't have been, and I was doing things I shouldn't have done. And I'd see people there, and I thought, man, that person's saved. Well, it's all right to be here and be saved. I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. I, I want to be a witness. Okay. Okay, I thought that was honorable, admirable. And then it wasn't very long when they were doing what I was doing and in rougher places than I was going. And I thought, man, I thought they were just trying to win people. Well, <laughs> we can't mix with darkness. When we mix with darkness, the darkness will, shine, will cover up the light. If we stick around trouble too long, trouble will get us. And we see that happening all the time. Now here in this, in this passage, when you get all through chapter 9, the focus on this is intermarrying with unbelievers. Isn't that something that, that, we, that goes on now? You know, I, I, you know, I'm I'm praying for Taylor's husband. Uh, man, he's he needs to be a God fearing man. Yeah, I know my daughter. <laughs> you talk about strong willed. She's her mama's young, and she 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 set. She's 25 and set in her ways. I I'm really praying for him, but I'm praying he's a godly man because I'd want him to be able to lead her. I will, and if he's going to lead her, I want him to lead her toward the Lord, not away from him. I want, I want her to marry a man that can be the head of the home and be the leader of his family. No matter how headstrong he, she is, he can be that. And I, if he's going to lead her, I want him leading her straight to Jesus. I want him to lead her into a deeper understanding than what she has of, of God. And he can't do that if he don't know the Lord. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're exactly right. Uh, they, they, they look at us as being arrogant that we're above other people because we, we will say, well, we should say to our kids, you know, you don't need to marry this person. They're not a believer. You don't need to date this person. They, they don't know the Lord. And, and really, I hope we were saying that to our children and grandchildren when our children and grandchildren know the Lord. You know, when they know the Lord, we need to, we need to help them see the, the, the trouble that can happen in a marriage. Now, now get, don't, don't get me wrong. There are some unbelieving people who are as fine as you're going you're gonna to meet. But there are things that go on in a marriage that don't have to go on. And every marriage is going to have its own struggles. It's going to have its own, it's going to have its ups and downs. It's pulls, it's ins and it's outs. It's going to have all of those things. But when one's a believer and one's a non-believer, you're going to generally have more issues than if both are believers. Um, now, what happens when they get married and one gets saved and the other doesn't get saved after they're married? You know, the Bible teaches us that a sanctified wife will sanctify her husband. Uh, and I think it's then, if it's the, the husband who becomes saved and the wife does not, then he continues to pray and he lives out God in front of them. That's after being married. But if you are walking into a marriage with that, you're already walking into something that's going to be strenuous, that more so than it has to be. But once you do choose that, when you choose that is the, the life you're going to live, then those consequences become yours to deal with and they become yours to live with. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, we get caught up and I heard someone tell me, but preacher, I believe the Lord sent him to me. <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> if he sent him to you, he didn't send you for you to marry him now. <laughs> If God is a God of his word, and I believe if he's faithful to anything, he's faithful to his word. If he's telling us here <laughs> that, not to, that it was an abomination because they were intermarrying with unbelievers, then it is today. It is today. Yeah, Unequally yoked. Unequal yoked, yeah. Because you, you put a horse and a steer... <laughs> in the same yoke, they're not going to pull together. They're going to go in different directions. One's going to go faster than the other, and it becomes a battle between the two while they're in that yoke. And that's not what it's meant to be. You put two steer together, and they'll walk through that field together. And that's what marriage is supposed to be. Here, they were going directly against God's word. And they had just got into town. <laughs> they just got into town. You remember why they were coming to town? To finish the temple. To put all the, all the resources they needed into finishing the temple so that they would have somewhere to worship. Where they could worship on the same foundation that they'd worshiped before, before it was destroyed. But, but they chose not to. God's law did not allow them to, to marry foreigners. Only if the foreigners turned away from their false, or he did allow them to marry foreigners, only if they turned away from their false God and turned to a lifestyle of serving the Lord. However, the Jews were never allowed to marry any of the native Canaanites. Now, that was one group of people they were forbade to marry or forbidden to marry. In Joshua 11 and 20, the Bible says, For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them, and that they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them as the Lord had commanded Moses. These were people that their heart was never going to turn to God. And the people of Israel were never to marry 
with them. Um, before the Israelites had arrived to the promised land of Canaan, the Canaanites had become so steeped in sin that they were beyond repentance. Y'all believe that happens today? There are people today so steeped in sin. You know, the Bible speaks of God removing himself or the spirit not dwelling with man always. Well, when we see that in Scripture, I think I believe he's speaking of, of the tribulation time or when after the church is raptured out. But I do believe there's some so steeped in sin that they seared their own conscience away from God. And as a people, they had done this. They were doomed to an eternal judgment. And by marrying these unbelievers and engaging in their despicable practices of immorality and wickedness, God's people had polluted and corrupted them on their own selves. Believers were mingling and associating with unbelievers, corrupting the holy seed. And that's, I think we see this oftentimes. This is an issue, especially with young, young Christians, that they struggle with. Because they get their eyes set on somebody and their emotions start taking over their bodies and, and their bodies start taking over their minds and, and they are filled with so much lust that, that they've just got to have this man or they've got to have this woman. And they can't see what God is trying to do to them. He's trying to protect them. He's not trying to offend them or hurt them. They, if, if they're a believer, we who are believers, we're part of a holy Seed, we're holy. And God's saying, don't corrupt that. Don't corrupt that holiness that, is, that we've placed upon you. It's a gift to us. Where Jesus died for our sins, he took our unrighteousness. And in, in his death, when we receive him, he places his righteousness on us. That's a gift to us. And he's saying, don't corrupt this gift that I've given you. Uh, remain separated from the world. He's not doing it to punish us. He's doing it to help us. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that, Brother Brian. It just, it, my, it, it was coming to my mind as you were saying that, that, that the trials that we go through, God chooses them for us. And we, can, we don't have to go into them upset, angry, or even afraid. The opportunities that God presents to us, they're for us. The opportunities he gives me is going to be different than he gives Miss Linda or he gives Miss Ernie. But the opportunities he gives Miss Lando and Miss Ernie are opportunities that he's designed for them. So whenever these opportunities to witness or to stand firm on his word or to go through a trial with, a, with joy in your heart because you're trusting him, he's designed that, that event in your life just for you so that we can do it. And, and you're right, I think we miss that so much that because we get caught up with everything else around us. Uh, we get caught up with all the turmoil that's going on. And, and you know, I, I got caught up in all this election stuff. For about six months or longer, I was just caught up and I was frustrated. And I just had to realize, man, this ain't what's important right now. This ain't what I've got to show the world. And I comment on Facebook about this stuff. I'm showing everybody how frustrated I am. If I'm a believer, they need to see that I'm, you know, I'm not worried about this stuff, that God's in control. And if we can, if we can mold ourselves to, to God's, well, we can't mold ourselves. If we can allow God to mold us to his will, 
to bend us to his will to where his will becomes our will. <laughs> then the things that are going on around us, all the chaos around us won't bother us. Well, and there's another area of this that he, when we talk about he's created us for. You know one thing that we're afraid of? We're afraid of change. We're afraid of the, we're not, we're not so much afraid of the event of change, but we're afraid of the backlash from change as a pastor. That, that's the first thing that hits me. Well, if we don't do this, if we do this, how is, how is the church going to respond to this? You know, that, that becomes the fear. But if God's placing that in my heart, shouldn't I follow that? If God's placing it in my heart after seeking him and it's confirmed, I shouldn't have that fear because he's, he's appointed me for this time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've said this either in the, in the preaching or the teaching here recently. The dread of stuff we find is often worse than the actual event. It, <laughs> yeah, stay up half the night or we're, we're ride for five miles from home to wherever we got to go, dreading to get there. and We're fussing and the whole way, how, bringing up every sort of scenario that's going to play out. We're stri- we've lost hair, we've lost sleep, we've lost, we- we've lost food, we've lost joy. <laughs> Over, well, you get there and it, it works out. It works out. Uh, <laughs> I-, I-, I think you- you're on to something there, Brother Brian, that-, that if we can remember that God has prepared us for this time, whatever it is that we're facing, whatever it is that's, that's coming before us, so we're, we're faced with this temptation. But God's prepared us for this temptation because he's told us he wouldn't put no more on us than what we can bear. So he's prepared us for it. Um, the thing is, I think as leaders within the church, it's our duty to get that into the people, help the people understand that you know, you can go out in this world and you can witness. You can go out and face whatever you have to face in the power of the Holy Spirit because God's prepared you. Not through us, but through the Holy Spirit. He's prepared us. Here, with the, with the children of Israel in their present situation, the leaders, both civil and religious, were the most offenders. And If the leaders are going down a, a wayward path, you can bet believe most of the congregation is going to follow. And that's, that's what was taking place. If, if I'm teaching a class and I've got eight-year-olds, eight and nine-year-olds filled up in a, in a class, if it's in a school system or if it's in a, in a church, and I'm teaching them the wrong way, they are going to be nine and ten-year-olds who went the wrong way for a while. So when they move up or move away from my class, they're, not, they're going to be lost. Because they've been taught wrong. They're going to follow. And often we are. We are people who would do that. That's why the Bible calls us sheep. That's why Jesus refers to us as sheep. We're sheep as people. We're, we, we have the tendency to follow. We have to learn to lead. It's easy to follow. And I, I believe there are some people who have an innate. There's just something in them when they were born. That they have this ability to lead. But the only way they can lead well is if they follow Jesus' path. They allow God to order their steps for them. Here, the leaders were going down the wrong path. They were the most unfaithful, they were the most sinful, and they were the most worldly. Now, I don't know how many have done, any, done much of a study on uh, Martin Luther. Uh, I love his story. If you, if you read his story or you watch a movie on his story, it is just a, it's a phenomenal story. Martin Luther was being, his family had put things away for him to be, to go to law school. They made great sacrifices for him to go to law school. And then one day he gets struck by lightning. <laughs> well, he gets knocked off his horse because of lightning. And he is in such Fear and trembling that he says, I'm not going to law school. I'm going to seminary. Oh, his, his, his father wasn't a happy man. Now, the seminary he was going to was Catholic, 
was a Catholic seminary. That's what he. That's all there was as far as religion at that time. It was Catholicism. That was the major religion, and he. There was no Baptist or there was no Protestant religion. He is the father of the of Protestantism. So here he is studying, and he gets in Paul's writings, and he starts to read about grace. And it becomes a challenge to him after hearing the instructors that he's getting. One of his instructors encourages him to go to the city. As a monk, he wasn't, they weren't allowed to go, but, but he goes because he was a student. He really weren't allowed to go, but they encourage him to go. And while he's there, he sees the priests, <laughs> the leaders with women of the night. Let's put it that way. He sees the church and their indulgences where people were paying so much money or they were bringing such a sacrifice to give to the church to get a certificate that says that you, through this sacrifice, you, you will not spend 10 years in purgatory. You got 10 years cut off of your term. Or if they crawled up the steps of the cathedral on their knees praying while they're coming up and down, it would remove that. They saw all this stuff going on that was being led by the church officials. And as he saw this, he began to have greater questions. And with those greater questions, he ended up breaking away from the Catholic church and, in essence, Protestantism denomination began. The, the, the Lutheran denomination is named after him, after Martin Luther. It's a story you'd love to, but what moved him was the corruption among the church leaders. And they had this, had this one guy, I, and when I saw the movie, I, I, I said, man, here's the father of televangelists. <laughs> Because this man, they would call, the Catholic Church would call Tertullian to come in. And as Tertullian would come, he would, he would just rile up the people. He was such a motivational speaker. He, when they needed a huge fundraiser, when the Catholic Church needed a fundraiser, they called him in. And he began to talk. And as he talked, he encouraged. And as he began to encourage, he persuaded. And as he persuaded people, they would give their life savings thinking it was going to get them time out of purgatory. Uh, <laughs> the corruption was within the church leaders in that day. It was even here in Ezra's day. They were, they were so corrupt that everyone else had no, nothing else to do but to follow. So the believers were, were spiritually, they were spiritually separated from wicked, or believers are to be spiritually separated from the wicked and evil of this earth. We're not to participate in sinful and worldly behavior of unbelievers. Immorality and gossip, hatred, greed, covetousness, lying, stealing, cheating, all these other sinful behaviors should not be a part of a believer's lifestyle. Are we going to live perfect? No, not as long as we're in this flesh. We're going to fall. But it shouldn't be our lifestyle. None of these things. If neighbors, fellow workers, classmates, or relatives, if they engage in such sinful behavior, we are not to follow them. We are to take a strong stand for righteousness, morality, for peace, we're to, do, we're to live different than the world lives. When dealing with immorality and unrighteousness, we're to live our lives in a spiritual separation. Uh, spiritually separated. Having nothing to do with wicked behavior. Now, keep this in mind. God doesn't expect us to become extremists. Uh, well, let's... Uh, we're not to live in isolation. Not to live in isolation from 
Yeah. And isolate ourselves from other people, from our coworkers, our classmates, our neighbors. We're to be a witness to them. We can't be a witness to them if we are never around them, if we never engage with them, if we never spend time with them. However, that spending time with our coworker who is engaging in sinful activity should not be while they're engaging in sinful activity. When we're spending time with our neighbor, it should not be when they're doing wicked things. Um, we should not be spending time with our classmates when they're up to no good. He counsels us to witness to the loss. He counsels us to disciple them and to, to uh, be a part of their lives, but we are not to associate with them. When I say associate, we're not to socialize with wickedness. God's instructions are clear. We must not fellowship and socialize with the wicked of the earth. Um, if we socialize with them, eventually they're going to seduce us or they're going to influence us to participate in their immoral behavior. You know, there was a time when, when you could actually, when you could find yourself walking into a building and people there would, would sort of straighten up what they were doing. They wouldn't, they'd find themselves, hold, 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 wait, wait a minute here. <laughs> Let's wait till they, they leave out before we keep doing what we're doing. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I heard this story and uh, I don't know if I should tell it, but I am. <laughs> my, uh, my father and my grandfather and my, Maybe one or two of the uncles, they, they, were, they weren't always saved. You know, they, at one time, they were like all of us at one time. They were, they were lost. <laughs> and they were at this place, and Mama wanted Daddy to come home. So I had to, I, either I wasn't born or I was really a baby, an infant, because uh, all I know about my Daddy is he was saved. But at this time, <laughs> he wasn't. And uh, Mama was bound to get him to come home. So she called Grandma. And they were the, one of these establishments that many of y'all would understand. They, they played cards there. They, they drank there. They done all sorts of stuff there. <laughs> Grandma said, well, I know where they're at. Here, come home. She broke into that place. I mean, she just walked right in there. And the owner said, Miss Joe, if you'll just leave peaceably, I'll make them leave. <laughs> if you would just leave peace she didn't have to say a word she just went in there looking for her boys and her husband and she found them there and they said we'll, we'll get them out of here <laughs> there used to be a time when that was when that was the norm we're not living in that time today we're not living oh man they would, they'd beat you out of there now or they'd call the cops on you for coming into their place uh, it's a, it's a different time, but we can't be a compromising people. We have to be willing to stand our ground. Uh, yes, yes, spend it, you've got to spend time with people to witness to them, but not while they're in the midst of their sin, not while they're in the midst of a behavior that's going to cause you to have to be threatened or cause you to want to compromise. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 2 Timothy 2 and 4 says, no one engaged in warfare, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlists him as a soldier. First John three, First John two, fifteen through sixteen says, "Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world." The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, 
but it's of the world. Uh, yeah. We, we must be set apart. We must be an example. Here, Ezra's just got into, it, into Jerusalem. And he's having to deal with this. Maybe, maybe he got into Jerusalem and he begins to notice things after getting settled. He's noticing, oh man, I brought these people from this pagan country and look what's going on in the country. Those who are supposed to be believers, those who are supposed to be following God, God's chosen people, they're engaging, they're marrying, intermarrying with the lost with the heathens of this, of this time that they were in. Um, they were intermarrying with pagans. And when we say pagans, they were intermarrying with those who were serving idol gods. Uh, yeah, we, we must be careful how we walk in life or we're going to be a hindrance to somebody else. Any questions or Thoughts or comments? Well, next week we'll we'll finish chapter nine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, I. I We, <laughs> yeah, we, we, you're right. You're exactly right. We've got churches that are leading people so far away from the will of God. I, yeah, churches saying it's okay. Uh, clergies, clergymen who are performing these ceremonies. They're not weddings, they're ceremonies. Uh, only a man can marry a woman. And uh, a woman marry a man. So these unions, these ceremonies, uh, you have clergy that's performing them and teaching that it's okay, God understands. Yeah, God understands it's sin. And, you know, listen... We are to love everyone, and we are to have compassion on everyone, but that compassion can't go to the point to where we compromise the Word of God. If our compassion goes to where it compromises God's Word, then it's no longer compassion. Now it's, it's an ideology that's accepted. It, it's, it changes. It becomes, it becomes compromise. And we, we have to be awfully careful. Now, listen, it's in every family. And we, we do have to be careful how we address things, how we deal with things. It's in my family, both sides of my family. Uh, it, it's, it's, in, it's in our families. And so we, we love them, but we love them enough to say that the only way you can make it to heaven is to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He can't just be your Savior. He's got to be Lord and Savior. That means surrendering your life to Him and obeying His Word. We can't obey Jesus and not obey the Word. And the Word doesn't change. It was 2,000 years ago, the same Word was profitable. 4,000 years ago, the same Word was profitable. And today, it hasn't changed. It's still profitable. Any other thoughts? Huh? Well, no others. We'll, we'll prepare for Sunday. I hope you, uh, those of you who are here, I, I pray that you'll be praying for me. Those of you who will be watching on television, be praying for me. <laughs> that uh, we have a clear direction for Sunday. <laughs>